Okay, thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Terry Huang. I'm a professor at the CUNY School of Public Health, um, where I lead uh, the Center for Systems and Community Design um, and co-lead uh, the NYU CUNY Prevention Research Center. Uh, and we are so pleased to be the hosts uh, of today's grant rounds at the CUNY School of Public Health. Uh, the pandemic has posed many challenges, um, but it has also given uh, rise to uh, many new uh, potential opportunities uh, for thinking about how we accelerate uh, the shaping of a more sustainable and equitable future. Um, and so uh, we decided uh, to host a hopeful and optimistic um, discussion today. Um, and we're so pleased um, that we were able to uh, have uh, Veronica Olasabal uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation um, to join us today um, to give the Grand Rounds presentation. Veronica is Senior Advisor and Director of Measurement, Evaluation, and Organizational Performance at the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, she has um, 20 years of experience designing, implementing, and leading global programs, research, and evaluation. Uh, and she brings this experience um, as well as her knowledge about cutting edge strategy, measurement, and learning practices to the foundation's work uh, in a variety of domains, including energy, equity and economic opportunities, food, yeah. health, uh, innovative finance, um, and others. Uh, she is on the advisory board of the American Evaluation Association and has received a number of awards, uh, including the Open, the Open for Good Award, uh, for supporting transparency and open data policies and philanthropy. And so um, uh, when we discussed, uh, you know, what uh, I, uh, Veronica would talk about today, um, you know, she proposed um, to share her insights with us uh, regarding uh, the future of philanthropy, particularly um, in the post-COVID world. Uh, and uh, so before I turn the uh, Mike, over to Veronica. I would just ask that everybody please mute yourself uh, during the presentation. Uh, we will have time for Q&A um, at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, Veronica, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Terry, for inviting me and having me here today. I am going to do a couple of different things, um, one of which is I'm going to share my screen. And let's see how that plays itself out today. So let's start there. Great. So far, so good. Great. Um, so uh, thank you again. Uh, I am going to talk about a couple of different things, as Terry mentioned. Um, and the roadmap that I'm going to walk you through is I'm going to start with where we've been, because I think often it's important to, to uh, problem solve, diagnose, take a look at where we are um, with a bit of a step back. I'm also going to talk then about how philanthropy throughout our time has been a vehicle for impact uh, through the lens of who we are, who the Rockefeller Foundation is today. And then I'm gonna do um, a little bit of a, a, a presentation around how we know if we're making a difference, which very much is situated in what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is thinking about how are we going to hold ourselves accountable um, to the many stakeholders that we are engaging with, as well as what are we gonna do with the data and then I'm going to close up and uh, hopefully we'll have enough time for us to uh, do some Q&A and have an active discussion. So I've done something that I've not done very often, but here I'm going to do it today, is I'm going to start with taking a poll. Uh, because I very much would like for us to be an engaging type of conversation. And so the question that I pose to all of you is, what is bigger? In your opinion, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, but what is bigger, government or philanthropic dollars? And what I would love for you to do is to go to this, uh, open up another window in your web browser or from your phone and type in the link that is at the bottom um, and that I've also uh, cut and pasted into the chat box, meet.ps backslash CUNY grand round. And while you're doing that and answering this question, I am going to actually pop up our current results. So let's see. Thank you for posting that, Paulo, into the chat. When you go to that site, uh, if you don't go somewhere, and there's a little bit of a header um, at the bottom that says poll, just click on poll. 
and please do answer the question. You will get the response pretty quickly. So let's see how we're doing with the responses. Great, what is bigger, government or philanthropic dollars? I'll give you a couple more seconds to, to fill that out. It looks like about 30 people have filled it out. So I know there's more than 30 people on the call. Giving you some time. Oh, oh. Okay. I'm gonna close close it off in a second. So anyone, any more, any more thoughts there? Okay. All right, now you can't change your answer because of what I'm about to say. So uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, while philanthropic dollars seem to be the greatest um, amount, it actually um, surprisingly is different and you're not allowed to vote anymore. So do not respond to my, to, to what I'm saying. So the OECD, which is uh, one of the larger organizations for economic development and cooperation in the world does this annual poll and they collect information about government dollars in terms of investments into the spaces where we where many philanthropies work such as climate, hunger, poverty, health, all of the big issues. And uh, what they have found is that when we, they look across the, the world, uh, philanthropic dollars is surprisingly quite small. It actually only accounts for, oop, looks like I have lots of chats. It only accounts for 2% of our actual spending um, in, Sorry, 2% of all of our actual spending. And that is without the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation dollars. And with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation dollars, Gates Foundation, otherwise known as Gates Foundation, which is about 50 times larger than the Rockefeller Foundation, that 2% only rises up to 5%. So the reason that's significant for this particular conversation is, is specifically because uh, clearly philanthropy is not that large. And so if we really wanna show up and meet the moment and have all of the impact that we aspire to really need to be strategic as to how we leverage our dollars. So I'm gonna talk from that vantage point. I'm gonna go back to um, sharing my screen. And let's see, oh no, where did my presentation go? Give me a second, so sorry, I must have turned myself off. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how it is then we're able to show up and uh, have the impact that we want to have. Give me a second to share my screen. Here we go. Okay, so as I mentioned, we wanna go back to the past in order to understand the future. So I'm gonna start about 100 years ago, and I know that that sounds like a long time, um, but the reason that I'm starting about 100 years ago is because the Rockefeller Foundation is uh, about 107 years old. So 100, and years, 100 years ago, what did the world look like? And surprisingly, it didn't look that different than it looks today, um, which is quite, uh, which is interesting. Uh, number one, the major causes of disease at the time, so we're talking about 1920, was uh, pneumonia and the flu, and TB, and then other gastrointestinal and the major disease um, at the time that they that people were contending with was the Spanish flu, which you've heard um, us talk about a lot uh, in the news recently um, in comparison to the uh, to COVID um, and the COVID moments that we're in. In addition, we were contending with a war, and so we had just emerged from the first World War One. We were also uh, uh, moving into the Great Depression. And so employment and joblessness was a major issue, um, just like it is today. And then the, the social issue of the time, and while there were many social issues, was uh, uh, the ones that made the headlines at the time was about women's suffrage and uh, gaining the right to vote in 1917. So why is this important? This was the, the system, the space that John D. Rockefeller was growing up in. He uh, lived um, at the late end of the 1800s, was born, and then lived into uh, the 1900s. And John D. Rockefeller, who is the founder of the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, became the richest and wealthiest man in the world through his uh, company called Standard Oil that many of you have heard about. Um, 
And the re and, and this is important for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation was the first foundation um, that the first, first philanthropy that existed in the US. And so many of the tax policies and all the regulations that control the way philanthropy works today were actually situated back back in the John D. Rockefeller times. Um, so why did John D. Rockefeller create a philanthropy? And so John D. grew up as a Baptist uh, and uh, he was also a penny pincher. Uh, so the, our archives tell us. We have actual documentation of his uh, accounting books when he was eight and nine years old, um, when he was uh, taking, keeping track of all the pennies that you know, he was uh, probably working to, to earn. And, um, and as he grew up and as he amassed this wealth, uh, he very much looked to his Baptist roots to give back to, to, to the world, to give back to, to uh, society. Uh, and so, and he, he made a couple of really critical investments during that time before there was a philanthropy. He uh, invested in something called the General Education Board for example, which was uh, an entity that was focusing on uh, capacity building in the South and that which later uh, would uh, be the seed to uh, thinking about um, county extension officers in, for the um, U.S. Agricultural Development Department, um, and which actually still is the system that uh, we live with today if you're in the agricultural space. Uh, he also, uh, the, through this organization, uh, this entity called the GEB, he also um, uh, started to think about hookworm. Hookworm, which I'll talk about a little bit later, was one of the um, issues, the diseases of the time, and he wanted to eradicate it. And so he was using all of this time and effort before there was a philanthropy to, to, to influence and invest his own personal dollars into these issues. And it just became unsustainable. Uh, it was just too hard to give away money. And in fact, it is actually quite a hard thing to give away money. Um, but we can talk about that later. And so uh, in about 1910, he asked his son, so John D. Rockefeller's here on the left, he asked his son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., also known as Junior, um, and another man named Frederick Gates to start to think about how to operationalize something that could be more sustainable uh, and that could, um, that could help move money um, in a way that was aligned with his own values. And so in 1910, uh, after all that work, uh, uh, Junior and Frederick Gates were um, able to um, charter the Rockefeller Foundation as an actual corporation. And, and then we became uh, actually incorporated in 1913. And why is that important? Because there was no playbook around what philanthropy should do. And in fact, because John D. Rockefeller just had so much money um, uh, uh, his fortune was actually quite large. It was larger than uh, the federal government at the time. It was quite intimidating to, to be thinking that this entity now wanted a tax relief statement in order to be able to do more good in the world. Uh, and so th there was a lot of suspicion, and so it took a little bit of time to do that. Uh, if you want to know more about the Rockefeller Foundation's uh, history, we have archived um, most of it in digitally, uh, and that address is at the upper right-hand corner. Uh, I will also share these slides so that you, for all of you historians, uh, you can go ahead and uh, research that a little bit more. So once we were incorporated, we now have spent the last 107 years uh, doing lots of different things, and I'm going to do a little bit of a of a, of a rapid review of the key milestones that we tend to be known for. Uh, and uh, so first, number one, hookworm. As I mentioned, hookworm was, um, was very prevalent. Uh, it was like 40% of people in the South had hookworm and it was a gastrointestinal disease. And so uh, as part of the before the Rockefeller Foundation that carried forward into the after the Rockefeller Foundation, we established something called the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission for the Eradication of Hookworm. Um, and uh, interestingly, the approach that we took to eradicate hookworm is very science-driven, similar to the approaches that we use today. Um, we mapped it out. We brought in a bunch of scientists and convened them together to be able to um, create an action plan to be able to drive that change. And uh, we'll come back to something similar that we're doing today that's very similar to that. And then in 1915, uh, we very, uh, uh, as in the hookworm example, we also developed something called International Health Division. 
uh, and they were uh, of working different types, one of which was yellow fever. And so we spent a good number of years bringing scientists together, convening them, um, investing in uh, different uh, trials to be able to come up with the yellow fever vaccine. And many of our early health interventions uh, actually were the fundamentals of public health uh, and the public health system. And so um, I know many of you are in that uh, focus on that area. And so there's a little bit of history there for you. Um, let, moving in on to another area that we're very much known for is the agricultural space. And so um, at, at the time, uh, probably in the 30s, starting in the 40s, uh, food scarcity, the, and pop, there was population growth, and then there was food scarcity. And the scientists of the times um, were yeah. starting to project um, that there would be a food shortage I mean, and a huge, oh, sorry, someone's on a mute. A, a bit of a hunger situation. And so uh, what we did in response, oops, sorry, okay, great, thank you. What we did in response is we brought, um, we, we brought a, a group of uh, agricultural scientists together and started funding it first in Mexico and then in Colombia and many different countries, uh, uh, trials around seeds, um, uh, exchanges of information and what soon became known as very contentiously uh, the Green Revolution, uh, which uh, on the one hand succeeded in generating a lot of different um, food and uh, stopping uh, 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 the mass starvation that we were anticipating. On the other hand, looking um, back, looking forward, uh, it's been contested for many of the environmental sustainability uh, challenges that it, ha it may or may not have, have surfaced. Uh, but from that, uh, we also um, spurred the development of something called the CGIAR system, which is the network of agricultural research centers that still exist today and are still problem solving around the food challenges of today. And then finally, uh, bringing us to, to the present time, uh, something else that we're very much known for is uh, formalizing the term impact investing in 2007. Um, the, our then president, Dr. Judith Broden, wrote a book called The Power of Impact Investing, but uh, that was the product of many conversations um, where we can be many different actors uh, and to consider what a different type of uh, financial mechanisms could be. Uh, what could that look like that could not just generate financial returns, but then can also um, generate both social and environmental returns. So those are just a really quick recap of what um, some of our, what we would call wins. There were definitely pluses and minuses to many of that, but, um, but I did want to uh, walk through that and now take a moment to reflect back on where we are today. So I don't have to tell you all of this because we're all living this together, um, but very similar to where we were in 1920, a hundred years later, we are now contending with yet another disease um, called the coronavirus. There are new uh, global alliances that are emerging. Um, it's not a World War I, or, um, but it is uh, definitely shaking things up a little bit. We have Brexit uh, that some of our European colleagues have been working um, and contending with. And then very near and dear to us, uh, we have the California wildfires, which is uh, very much bringing to um, um, uh, our light and reinforcing uh, some of the climate change issues that we are having with and that our generation has to contend with. And then finally, um, amongst all of this other chaos, uh, we, uh, it has basically surfaced many of the inequities that have been prevalent over the last, uh, have been building over the last hundred years um, and that we've seen through the recent social protests and civic unrest. So let me talk a little bit about how philanthropy has uh, met the moment. Um, and so here, you know, it's funny because when you think about the size, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're pretty insignificant relative to all of the financing that's available in government. And we're not private sector, right? We're somewhere of this in between where we get to benefit from having a nonprofit type of status but we have very little guardrails. There's, um, we don't have many accountability mechanisms. We don't have shareholders. We don't have the public um, and tax dollars to account for. Uh, and so on the one hand, um, that's a good thing. So that's the opportunity. And uh, on the other hand, that creates some challenges um, because you know, we, um, we 
could just go pretty rampant uh, and invest in many things. And without an accountability mechanism, we could create a lot of harm. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of that later, but for right now, I'm going to talk a bit about our superpowers. So this is the opportunity piece. This is what makes philanthropy um, a really useful financial tool, I would say. Um, number one, our capital is pretty nimble and it's pretty flexible. Um, we are able to uh, see a need like COVID, and I'll talk a little bit about how we are uh, meeting this particular moment in time, or hookworm, or yellow fever, or all the, many, the things that I've talked about in the past. We're able to see it and quickly deploy capital to it. So it makes us very, uh, very nimble and flexible. We can deploy capital to one issue, and then all of a sudden, like the world changes again, and we could redeploy it to another issue. Um, we're not like a huge, huge steering um, like cargo ship that can't be positioned, like pivoted. We we are pretty much like these little zip boats. We can zip in and out of things, uh, and that makes us a very good tool for uh, doing many of the things and responding to many of the issues of our time. Uh, what I've done here is I've laid these pieces out so that when you get this particular deck, you're able to also click in and learn a little bit more or um, and, m and make up your mind for yourself, um, diagnose and critique what I'm saying um, uh, on your own. But for now, um, just bear with me. We are also able, we have this ability to take a lot of risks. So um, oftentimes, while we're very small, two to five percent of all this government spending out there, um, we also have the ability to, to say, you know, put some skin in the game and um, try out different mechanisms. Uh, and so, uh, we, for example, with impact investing, you know, we had a hunch, we had a hypothesis, we put some dollars into the issue, we tested some things out, and lo and behold, a, a new field was was created, um, very similar to the early, earlier days of John D. Rockefeller. We had a hunch, he had some resources, he put it uh, to use, and lo and behold, we were able to eradicate hookworm. Uh, and uh, we don't see ourselves as necessarily the scaling mechanism, but we can definitely do some testing, proving that some things can work, and hopefully convince others that have the ability to bring more dollars or more capacity or more resources to the conversation and deploy and actually uh, change the policy around that. When I first came to the Rockefeller Foundation about 12 years ago, I felt that I spent a lot of time in meetings. Um, there were lots of meetings, lots of people talked about lots of different things. Uh, and, and so I feel like I've definitely cre um, developed a, a little bit of an affinity for meetings. However, this is a secret power, uh, a superpower that the, the philanthropies have. Philanthropies are not government. Um, they can be perceived as nonpartisan and neutral. They're also not private sector, so they're not like the big evil people. And so uh, we have the ability to convene um, actors, not the usual suspects, together to help pro problem solve. And often it takes the convening of the scientists and the policymakers and the frontline workers to come together and be able to problem solve something, create an action plan, deploy it, and then everybody goes to their own specific areas a little bit more aware of what others are doing a little bit more able to connect those dots and um, and a little bit uh, and we believe that we're then able to move the needle a little bit faster and so our convening power is certainly something that that shouldn't be taken to um, for granted uh, the Rockefeller Foundation's brand and reputation precedes us and so I have been very surprised that when we call a meeting together people show up and so I don't necessarily just feel like a party planner anymore I know that the strategy behind it and then finally, the world is very complex. And government, uh, once government is involved in a particular issue, it commits for a number of years for hopefully more than one administrative uh, election, but usually 10, 15, 20 years, whether it's an infrastructure project or whether it's a public health campaign of some sort. The evidence actually shows that um, it takes about 25 to 40 years for an actual big investment to deliver um, outsized or even just regular outcomes and impacts, uh, and there's a lot of um, and there's uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, cases that have proven that. In the philanthropic side, we don't have 25 to 40 years. Um, in fact, we want to be able to think really critically, innovate, 
figure out the complexity, unpack the complexity, and then move forward as quickly as possible, because that is when our, our financial tool works best in the ability to think about outside the box solutions and the ability to get to the root of something and invest all that we can into that one thing that hopefully unlocks clarity for those actors that are much bigger and that are able to um, engage and scale most of what it is that we're learning. So those are our superpowers and I hope that you can see that we have utilized these powers um, so to speak, uh, throughout our 107 year history. Um, I'm gonna stop here and talk a little bit uh, before I start to talk a little bit about where we are today. And I'm gonna go back to our questioning. So pop quiz, let's see how this one plays itself out. Um, the question is, if you could address one thing in the world, what would it be? So I'm gonna open up the poll. If you could, again, go back to that same link that you were in just a second ago, and let me just open it up for us and answer that question. If you could address one thing in the world, what would it be? And if anyone's having trouble, just unmute and let me know so that I can try to fix it and problem solve for it in real time. And while we're doing that, while you're typing away over there, I am going to stop sharing. And I'm going to try to share the results. So you should have gotten a little next button. Let's see, here we go. So if you could address one thing in the world, what would it be? So you had all the Rockefeller money and it was in your pocket and you could put it into something, what would it be? So it looks like we have about 50 people that have answered. Wait a few more minutes or seconds. And don't be swayed or biased by everyone else's responses. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to stop. And I, and I know that you haven't stopped because I can still see movement. Okay, great. So we have a pretty diverse response. Um, for the most part, climate change seems to be the biggest issue of our times. Uh, and many of you feel that we should be focusing on climate change. Interestingly enough, not that many of you feel like we should be focusing on health and disease surveillance, even though we're in a pandemic. Uh, and, uh, and many of you also think that we should be focusing on social unrest and human rights. Um, the reason that I asked uh, for you to go through this exercise, it's because that is the same exercise that we go through at the Rockefeller Foundation and every philanthropy goes through. We have limited resources, we have limited staff, uh, and we need to show up and meet the moment at the best that we can. That means that we have to make some choices. We have to have some trade-off conversations because we can't do everything for everyone. Um, so with that as the backdrop, I'm going to go back to the presentation. Great. Can everyone see my, my screen? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Okay. So thank you, Dorothy. Um, so who are we today? 107 years later. Later, you would think we would be really different. Um, to some extent, we are different. We look a lot different. We've moved a few times. We're actually renovating our spaces right now. Uh, but a couple of things have remained, um, one of which is our mission statement, for the most part, has remained the same. So our mission statement, since we were incorporated in um, the early 1900s, has been to promote the well-being of humanity throughout the world. There is one editorial that I'd like to make, and that is that, in fact, um, and the sign of the times, uh, until um, our last president, um, Dr. Judith Broden, who was the first female president the Rockefeller had had, uh, became president, it used to say, promote the well-being of mankind throughout the world. So we have changed that to be a little bit more, um, uh, I, I think, aligned to where we are. Uh, today, the Rockefeller Foundation advances uh, new frontiers of science, data, policy, and innovation to solve 
uh, global challenges um, related to many of the things that Terry mentioned I work on, which is health, global health, food, power, meaning energy access, equity, and economic opportunities. And we do that um, through fostering um, these organizational goals um, where we position all of that work under something called our initiatives. We then think about innovations, which I'll talk a little bit about in the next slide. And, and I think something that's different is we think about what the institutional capabilities should be. So how do we not just do good work, but how do we show up as, um, as an equitable, inclusive and diverse organization, which is something that we've been contending with um, over the last couple of years. So um, as so we have these programmatic areas that I talked about and food and health are part of our legacy. We have a good foundation around them. Um, energy and climate have become um, much more prevalent and a priority for us over the last uh, a decade, I would say. And then equity and economic opportunities is a very US focused portfolio. And we have this other portfolio called Co-Impact, which is testing out a new and different philanthropic model of working, which is collaborative philanthropy and essentially working with um, pooling different funders investor, um, and investors funds and uh, essentially ch uh, the Rockefeller Foundation is channeling them into doing good work. And then we have um, these pieces that we call our capabilities, which is um, how we do our work. So we have our innovative finance work that is our impact investing 2.0 uh, or maybe 3.0. Um, and we see that as doing food, health, doing all this programmatic good um, with an innovative finance uh, lens and perspective to it. Many of you have also probably heard us talk about our data science and technology efforts, um, our data for good initiative. We really see data science, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence as the new frontiers. And we're thinking about how do we harness that, those, the, those things for good. Uh, and then finally, I've talked a lot about convening. Um, I certainly have a really good appreciation for how important it is to be able to bring people together to talk about the issues that matter. Um, more so now than I did before I came to the philanthropic space. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what this means really concretely to us um, as an example. And if everyone can mute, please, that would be great. So, uh, so one example that's very live, that's very relevant to the times, is um, some of the work that we've been doing in response to COVID. And so in April of 2020, right after we in the Northeast went into lockdown in March, um, the Rock, we, the Rockefeller Foundation, issued something called the National COVID-19 Testing and Tracing Action Plan, which was essentially a roadmap to help um, not us, but others safely reopen the economy by focusing on a couple of things. One is scaling testing, and another thing is contact tracing, which has become the talking points that you hear um, but about across the various different um, agencies, actors around, well, most of them around, you know, what the solution is. Uh, and so from that work, um, that was, uh, uh, you, can, you can look that up. There's an actual action plan and a report onto that. From that work, we wanted to action the recommendations from that work. And so we developed something called the Testing Solutions Group, which is a network of public officials um, uh, and uh, and, uh, and they're doing a couple of different things. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the nature of, the, of this network, but needless to say, again, we're convening different people. We're using science to be able to diagnose what those uh, issues are, and we're using our capital to then be able to strategically deploy um, in, um, uh, around really good solutions. Um, so for the testing solutions group, we're doing a couple of things, which is uh, we're providing an opportunity for others, not us to exchange and engage, um, focus on testing and tracing and, uh, and how to operationalize, how to action that, those pieces of work. And so oftentimes, uh, particularly now in this virtual world, we um, tend to get into silos. Like, it's very hard to know what's going on around us because uh, we can't actually be there. So this group brings together um, scientists with frontline workers, with public officials at the county level, at the city level, at the state level to be able to problem solve together. Uh, and in that regards creates a peer network group um, that is bipartisan. So we kind of move away from the politics and we move uh, into this more objective problem solving mode. Um, and, and then what we're doing is we're uh, 
taking the insights from this particular group and we're packaging it into knowledge products and resources that could be shared with others that are thinking about how do we scale um, testing and contact tracing. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see that uh, for the most part, this is a pretty, pretty broad group of people. Uh, in, uh, we started off with nine and now we have um, more than 30. Uh, and so uh, I, I think it's, uh, we've been seeing really good results from this work, which is, which is heartening, particularly because again, uh, change, takes, uh, change takes a lot of time and we don't just, in this COVID climate, we don't have it. And so um, we've seen a lot of really good exchanges happen uh, across this network. Another way that we're responding to the moment that leverages all of our superpowers is in um, this project that's focused on uh, in Baltimore called the Baltimore Health Corps. And this really takes our uh, engagement to the field. Uh, something that we have tried to do, but haven't done well, like we're not excellent at it. I don't think anyone is excellent at it, is actually asking people what it is that they need in places where we want to work and not kind of creating an othering where we're talking about a group of people that live over there while we are problem solving over here. So the Baltimore Health Corps actually takes the solutions and the development to the field. Uh, and so this is um, uh, an initiative um, that, uh, that is uh, responding to some of the critique that we've heard about contact tracing where people aren't picking up their phone or they're, getting being, they're being asked about like who their networks are and don't feel the trust that's needed in order to be able to contact trace effectively. Um, and, and what it does, it's in places where we work, um, or where in places where Baltimore Health Corps works, um, they employ about 300 different uh, local individuals um, that are uh, aligned to the demographics of the most vulnerable populations in Baltimore um, that are earning um, a living wage, and they provide them health benefits. And these, uh, this group of people um, become our contact tracers. So we're number one, working on the contact tracing, number two, employing uh, people in the community uh, in a more equitable way. And so ideally, uh, we're thinking about beyond response, uh, beyond recover, beyond response and thinking about recovery and sustainability. And so after this 12 month pilot, ideally workers would be able to transition into jobs um, and uh, different types of career opportunities in the healthcare space. Uh, and so we're thinking not just about the immediate needs, but in terms of the intermediate and the longer term needs. And then finally, I'm gonna pivot a little bit and talk a little bit more about our innovative finance portfolio, because I know some of you are interested in our impact investing work. So we have this very broad uh, innovative finance portfolio. It's about $87 million deployed, deployed across 30 different countries. Um, and for those of you in the investment space, um, it's ver a very diverse por portfolio in terms of uh, the types of tools that we're using to be able to test out um, this work for us. And why it's interesting, um, again, is because it touches on many of the different um, strengths that philanthropy brings to the sector. So this is uh, a bit of a, of a teaser because I'm not gonna talk very much about this. Um, this is uh, our zero gap uh, investments portfolio. And the zero gap work is interesting because um, number one, it's a collaborative between the MacArthur Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. So MacArthur has essentially invested um, many millions of dollars into the Rockefeller Foundation. And with the, our dollars, we are now co-investors into many of these uh, funds and enterprises. Uh, and so again, uh, testing out the collaborative philanthropy model. That essentially also makes the, found, the Rockefeller Foundation accountable to the, market, the MacArthur Foundation for our results. Um, in addition to that, when we look at each of these investments, uh, we are thinking about testing different ways of, of showing up um, and meeting the moment. So the Forest Resilience Fund, for example, is pretty relevant in that it's looking at um, this issue of wild, why wildfires even happen. And so the learnings from our from Blue Forest will be applicable to what's happening in California. And this this investment was something that we um, um, started even before the current uh, situation. We're also looking at job employment, uh, and we're looking at women's livelihoods. And so this is a quite a diverse portfolio. Um, Zero Gap um, is intended to uh, be a significant of. of the SDGs and the financial gap that it's really going to take to be able to deliver on a global agenda. Um, and you can read more about it in our first annual impact report 
which is uh, at the bottom here. And uh, again, you'll be able to click through um, when you get the slides. Uh, I myself uh, have a lot of pride in this work because it's not often that impact investors or investments um, are transparent uh, and demonstrate and try to model and lead with good behavior around uh, transparent pra practices around like how, what it is that we are doing when we say we're measuring impact, what do we mean by impact investments? And so this has been a very good um, example of us of walking our own talk, which I hope the, that we and all of philanthropy um, does more and more. So I only have 15 minutes, really. Well, I have a, a, a couple more minutes left. Um, but um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we even know we're making a difference. Uh, and, and, and this is near and dear to my day-to-day -day work, as I mentioned earlier. It's about data, it's about accountability, it's about measurement and evaluation and all those things that some of us are really interested in, or at least I am. Uh, and so our last question of the day, we're gonna take our um, one more poll and uh, I'd love to hear your perspectives on in the big picture, does it matter if philanthropy holds itself accountable? So I've opened up the poll. I hope that you, you can get to it. I'm going to uh, stop sharing and pivot to the polling sites. And I'm going to hopefully move to the next. Okay, here we are. Oh, good. The right answer so far, not to sway you. Great, and uh, it looks like we're getting the hang of this. 55 of you have responded this time. We're kind of teetering between not sure. Okay, so the majority of you feel that philanthropy should hold itself accountable. I am going to turn to you for a minute and I would love for some brave student, person, faculty member out there to uh, just share with us a little bit of why you think that, uh, that we should be holding ourselves accountable. So who's gonna speak? I have three pages of you, so I can't really see. So if somebody just wants to uh, turn on their, turn off their mute button and tell me, share with the group, why should philanthropy hold itself accountable? That would be great. Well, I'm the dean of the school, so perhaps they put pressure on me to uh, pontificate first before everybody else says something more wise than I can. Um, I really think, as you said, the resources are limited and the problems are big. Um, and so it is incumbent upon philanthropic organizations to feel the great responsibility on their shoulders because they are, uh, they have been delegated the responsibility of investing where investment matters. Um, much of the stream of resources that are uh, preconditioned, federal and otherwise, don't have the flexibility that you have. And therefore, your ability perhaps to listen uh, and you, your or ability also to have a quick turnaround of monitoring and evaluating yourselves and your relationships is a situation that no other source of funding can have. Perfect. How about that? That was great. Thank you very much. Response. That's so wonderful. Now people can really talk and uh, they're challenged by my limitation to say things that are okay. more meaningful. I'm going to take one more response. And Alec, it looks like you've unmuted. Yeah, I'd just like to chip in and, and just following up on that point. Um, it's really interesting to see that philanthropic organizations can pivot very quick depending upon situations as they did in COVID and other situations as well. I also feel that that is a really big superpower that also allows the government to take the lead and find out what is really important in this moment because the flexibility is the issue and many times philanthropic organizations and especially local CSOs set the direction for governments to see how accountable they are and how something can be brought to life any specific movement. So that is something that I find to be really important and you know, that's how I feel that 
we should be really happy. Great. So thank you so much because you teed my next uh, set of slides up and then we'll pause and have some time to uh, engage in many of the things that have just been shared. So let me go back to my slides. Uh, and this is the last time I'll go through this. Great. Um, I'm just surprised that the technology has been working with us. So let's hope that it continues. Um, so uh, before we uh, head into it, I, I agree. And, you know, I, I really like, uh, it stuck with me. I know that, you know, perhaps it's out of, of, of our usual academic um, and very uh, informed circuits. But, you know, the, the quote that has stuck with me is the Spider-Man quote that with, uh, with great strength comes great responsibility. Uh, and I, I do think that philanthropy for the most part, even though we don't have the guardrails or the limitations, have self-imposed in many different ways, different accountability mechanisms. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the one uh, that I most have influence over, which is the way we manage results and impact. Uh, and so many, any different philanthropies structure themselves in all kinds of ways. Uh, uh, we have uh, structured ourselves in a way that we see managing results and impact everybody's business. Um, and the reason that we do that is because we all need data. Um, we need data for number one, to know whether or not we are moving in the right direction so that we can adaptively manage as necessary, um, to, to know whether or not we're meeting the mark in terms of research, re return on investments, and also to know, you know um, whether or not we're ready to scale something. Um, in addition to that, we manage our results and impact um, because we should be accountable and we definitely, um, as an organization feel, we need to hold ourselves accountable to various different audiences, one of which is our grantees and our end users or, uh, and beneficiaries. Um, I know that's a pretty loaded term, but the, the people that are receiving resources in the field. Uh, foundation staff and leadership, we wanna hold each other accountable for our decision-making. Um, we are very much accountable to our board and trustees uh, and other stakeholders that are entrusting with us their resources so that we have to be responsible stewards of that. And then lastly, um, because we are able to be innovative, because we are able to take these risks um, that not other actors can take. We also learn a lot. And it's, it's, it's sort of like that, that the statistics on like startups, most of them will fail, some of them will succeed. Most of our initiatives will fail, some will succeed. But because we have uh, undergone those experiences, we'd like to package what it is that we learn to better inform those that are in positions of scaling different pieces of work. So we often call that building the evidence base. Um, I'm gonna, this sounds, uh, a little bit specific. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this really looks like for us. Um, because often you get into, these days, often you get into a room and everyone's talking about impact, impact, impact. Um, we have decided that in order for us to better manage our results and impact, we need to uh, expand, fine tune what it is we actually mean by these terms. So um, we are guided by three principles, one of which is about in being impact oriented. And by that, we mean that our measurements, um, our lines of accountability are very much situated and go hand in hand with strengthening the impact of our work at the level of people's lives. So we care about systems, we care about policies, we care about advocacy, we care about all these things. But when we are going to invest resources into being able to monitor, evaluate, measure, um, our results, we very much are looking um, to see what quantitative and qualitative changes have happened in the lives of actual people and communities. So that's how we define impact. Uh, we, a, um, you guys are, uh, or you women and men are a uh, public health uh, audience. And so um, you probably have heard of the randomized control trial, the RCT. Um, we tend to not be uh, methodologically agnostic. Um, every issue out there has a, a particular method or a methodology that is needed in order to be able to um, align with the intent of the results. So we spend a, a good amount of time thinking about what are the right methods, who are the right partners, what types of data collection approaches are fit for purpose, um, and keeping audiences in mind. And then finally, uh, we are biased uh, these days, uh, unlike government, 
We are biased these days towards um, approaches that are timely and actionable. And that takes on a more cutting edge, innovative flair to it. Um, uh, we, as particularly in this COVID moment, are not in a position to be able to go to communities and collect information um, via tablet or paper formats uh, and, and then send them back to, to be analyzed. We're no longer in, those, in, in that scenario. And so we're thinking about, you know, how do we leverage mobile? How do we leverage geospatial analysis? How do we leverage data science to be able to meaningfully say something about the places and spaces where we work in, um, at some point uh, we might be talking about Fortnite, like in a very, very timely type of way. And we're not there yet, that's the challenge, but the opportunity is there. Uh, and, and we're willing to uh, take the risk to explore and expand um, what those pieces are. I'm not gonna take too much time to talk about um, these five, uh, these uh, primary use cases, because I'd like to spend a little bit more time on the next slides, which is um, what we've learned about um, what makes for um, uh, drive uh, successful mechanisms and ways to drive impact. Uh, and they're not methodologically oriented. Um, they are more about how we structure and design. So uh, here, what we've done is uh, we've realized that asking the right questions at the right times helps us to optimize for social and environmental performance. This is particularly relevant to our impact investing in our innovative finance portfolio. This is an excerpt out of our first annual impact report that I talked about. And so we ask ourselves five questions and we design them into all of our, pre uh, our due diligence stages before we actually make the investments. Um, so we start off with asking ourselves, and these are no brainer questions, but it, it actually does take a lot of structuring. Like, what are we trying to achieve? Who are we trying to reach? At what rate? What is our contribution to generating the change? And what are some of the unintended risks? And I would say that that last question is quite critical because uh, if we're investing into new product and service lines, we wanna make sure that our fund managers, our investees have thought through not just the positive impacts that could happen, um, but the negative ones that could happen too, because we don't want to mar um, distort markets. We don't want to create, um, as in the Green Revolution, um, environmental issues. Um, and, and while some of this will happen regardless of, of, of what, you know, what we plan, because you know, plans never really work themselves out, at least we're having the tough conversations earlier versus um, where we used to be, which is, we make an investment, we make a grant, and then I get called up to a room and someone asks me at the end of, of, of a life cycle of investments, what is the impact? And it's very hard to answer that question after the fact. Um, government does that because they have to be accountable to public dollars. And so lots of measurement and evaluation strategies have been set up in service to government. Philanthropy is very much trying to redesign and re-question when it's strategic to have these conversations specifically because, um, as your dean was saying, we have very limited dollars and very limited staff, and so must be very, very, very strict about how it is we are going to deploy those resources, and so this helps. The next piece that we've uh, uh, talked about and that I alluded to earlier um, that we've learned is about listening. So who we listen to matters. Uh, and oftentimes, um, over the last 100 years, um, philanthropic actors um, have been talking to each other, some more so than others. Uh, and and you know, that just uh, sets you up for lots of false starts where you create lots of different products and services and initiatives that, are, that sound really good on paper in theory, but when rubber hits the road, just fall apart because they're not aligned to the realities and to the needs of the communities in which we work. So we've started thinking about how do we listen um, better and more and um, faster to um, the stakeholders that are actually experiencing um, many of the um, issues that we're trying to problem solve. Around. And we do that at the field level. We've been experimenting with mobile data collection in terms of feedback. We do it with our grantees. We're working to build the capabilities of our grantees to be able to actually problem solve with their constituents and their beneficiaries um, in order to um, ensure that we're kind of getting to all the very different aspects of what listening could mean like, mean to um, our work. And then finally, 
Um, as you know, we all know, we're, we're living this interesting time where we're all home and we're all virtual. Uh, and so uh, we've been considering what the new norms are for managing impact. Um, and I've touched a little bit upon that, but uh, this, uh, this moment in time is really challenging us to be able to do all the things that we set ourselves out to do in a different and new way. And so, as I mentioned, we're experimenting with mobile data and thinking about geospatial analysis and what that means, um, remote sensors and big data. And the pieces to keep in the back of our minds um, that we're trying to, to always put at the forefront of our thinking is what are some of the ethical challenges that, that these new technologies are bringing? How do we um, aim to design more equitable algorithms? How do we aim to work with, um, to, to amplify the voices of computer scientists um, of color, for example? Uh, and so these are the new challenges of the world that are being um, uh, somewhat more um, amplified, magnified, so to speak, um, because of the moment that we're in right now. So as a wrap up, I hope this has been very interesting to you. Um, uh, and I hope that you've learned a little bit about what the power of philanthropy is and what our limitations are. Uh, and, and that even while the world is shifting, time and time again, we as an entity, because this is the Rockefeller Foundation has been the example that we've been using through this talk, but you can put in the Packard Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, the Gates Foundation. There's so many foundations out there, the Ford Foundation. They, we all show up to meet our moment um, in the ways that we can um, throughout time. Uh, and so it is this ability, this, this ability to deploy capital quickly and flexibly that makes us a good tool for innovation and risk-taking. Um, our positionality or our lack of positionality in our terms of being neutral helps break down barriers that brings diverse groups of people together to help problem solve. Um, however, the challenge is that no one is holding us accountable. How is it that we are then self-imposing um, these, these processes uh, and being transparent and forthright with our engagement and our work? Uh, because at the end of the day, we're very small. We're never going to be able to take the place of government. And so um, we need to be able to work in a very collaborative way and we need to be able to share what it is that we're learning with those actors that are in positions to take things to scale. So this visual, which I think is a great visual because it shows um, a lot of people doing a lot of very good work, is from an article in the Social Science Stanford Review called Reimagining Institutional Philanthropy. I'm going to leave you with this thought. So um, I represent the Rockefeller Foundation, represents the Legacy Foundations. There is a whole lot of new philanthropy that has entered the world because of the tech boom. Uh, and we haven't really talked about you know, their engagement and their uh, ways of doing the work, um, but we are at a time where we even um, in philanthropy are reimagining some of uh, these institutional philanthropies now with these new tech giants. And so this article here um, talks a little bit more about that. With that said, I can open up for questions. Thank you so much, Veronica, uh, for giving us the history of the foundation and uh, just uh, you know generally um, how philanthropy works um, uh, in the varied ways um, that uh, philanthropies invest their dollars. Um, so, so this has been really terrific. Uh, we have some time now for Q and A. Uh, perhaps I'll start out with uh, my question, and then hopefully that gets the uh, juices flowing for everybody. Um, I wonder, Veronica, if you could say a little bit more about the uh, impact investing work um, that the foundation has been uh, involved in, how the foundation has approached it. Um, there are a lot of different partners, uh, uh, institution, institutional and otherwise, um, that are part of that uh, portfolio. Um, what, what is the... Uh, the sort of uh, design of it uh, and, and, and where is it headed? All right, that's kind of a big question, but I'll try to answer it. Uh, so um, I talked a little bit about how we had formalized the impact investing space. And at that time, so this was um, over a decade ago, we um, saw impact investing as a program. Uh, and we, so it was more programmatic and based on infrastructure development. So we developed organizations like the Global Impact Investing Network, B-Lab. Um, we, uh, we thought, it, which we call like the plumbing in the impact investing space. 
about uh, about five to six years ago, we then transitioned that portfolio um, out of, or actually probably a bit more time ago, out of being a program and um, and into um, actually trying working to invest. And so now um, that portfolio is purely investments. There are some uh, efforts in there um, that are about field building and grant building. So. I would say that the current invest, uh, the current portfolio is split um, between the side that invests and the side that grant makes. And the side that grant makes doesn't in grant make and invest in um, infrastructure, but it invests in new and interesting uh, products and services that, um, and so our grant dollars become like the seed capital. And so many of the investments that I talked about in our zero gap portfolio that are now actual pure investments started off in this grant uh, piece where we basically incubated them. So the Forest Resilience Fund, for example, um, was, um, was a good example of that. And once it becomes large enough to attract other investors, it then moves into this other bucket of funds around impact investing, um, a, a pure investments. And what we try to do is we try to align those investments to our programmatic work. So in the, in the philanthropic space, there's this thing called a program-related investment, which is an investment that's tied to some of the programmatic goals. So our portfolio is starting to look more and more like our grant-making portfolio proper, which is focused on health, uh, which is focused on um, energy, um, which is focused on uh, agriculture and things of that nature um, on the one hand. And then bigger, bigger picture is what we really want to make, be sure, uh, make sure that we're able to do is um, uh, invest in entities that helps us demonstrate the power of the sustainability development goals. And as you know, there's 17. We're kind of in UNGA mm -hmm. month. Uh, it's virtual. It's very different. Uh, but, uh, but that is essentially the goal of those, those pieces of work. And our team is really open to listening and hearing out new ideas. So uh, for those of you who have them, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to connect you to that team to see if there's a fit. Fantastic, thanks so much, Veronica. Um, do we have uh, any uh, other questions uh, from the audience? Uh, it looks like Alok has raised his hand. Oh, we can use the raise. His hand. I was trying to use this, not talk over anyone, so that's why I use that feature, I think. Um, so yeah, I think I think uh, Veronica, thank you for the talk. Uh, I probably have a question which you are probably the best person to answer since you are into monitoring evaluation and um, looking at the data to find out how we have done in the past. Um, my question is how easy or difficult do you find impact figures to be quantified in a sector such as philanthropy? It's easier to, you know, as a corporate company, it's easier to find out how many number of units of a product we have sold but how easy or difficult is it to quantify how many people have been impacted through a certain program? Um, yeah. Sure. So um, that's a very big question. Uh, and it's something that we contend with every day. It's like, how do we quantify the results of our work? Uh, we, there's a couple of different ways that we do, um, but I'd like to say that it's not that different. Counting products and services is not that different from counting people. What we often say is um, that's an output. And we spend a lot of time talking about outputs and outcomes um, in the measurement space. Uh, and so our tool of choice, um, which we use at the beginning of the design phase, we have a bit of a human-centered type of design approach, is um, the theory of change. And a theory of change um, is a, basically a, a bit of a mapping around how we assume the change will happen. And that actually allows us to surface all of the assumptions that we have about that change like how are we going to get from like big picture to small picture um, and we surface a bunch of questions and through our grant making vehicle we th this is all pre-work through our grant making work we then um, deliver and design grants um, with our partners to be able to test out those hypotheses and play out those assumptions which allows us to to kind of take a little bit of a portfolio perspective on our programs and so each grant um, luckily has to report in some way what they're delivering. And so a lot of our pipeline of, of data points are self-reported data. Uh, and, uh, and we use that to be able to manage um, and course correct as we talked about. I think that the piece that we often don't talk about is, is that's measurement, um, is evaluation. 
So evaluation is a really great tool, not just to do research, not just to um, prove concepts and things of that nature, but it's a really great tool to be able to say, hey, I'm gonna go into the field and with all of these data points that we have, um, I'm gonna actually validate them. And, uh, and through that, through an evaluation, that's when we are able to take a step back and say, well, we have lots of reports to say that we touch the lives of millions of people in meaningful ways. Is any of that actually true? And so evaluation allows us to hold up the mirror and determine whether or not we are actually moving in the right direction and whether or not we are causing harm. That then clearly layers into that next cycle of grant making. But yes, it's quite difficult and complicated, but the reporting structure allows us to be very, very concrete because uh, we have to land on something that's quantifiable and qualifiable in order to ensure that the grantee is complying with the philanthropy's um, vision and that the philanthropy is enabling the grantee to deliver on their Thank mission. You so That's really helpful, the reporting structure thing. Um, Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, Caroline, looks like she has raised her hand. Hi. Hi, yes. Um, so I am interested in learning more about community listening. Um, and I appreciate that you touched on it because that's feedback that I have heard about philanthropy and sort of charity at large is that it really needs to involve stakeholders more often. So it seemed to me like I could, I could understand a lot of the community listening and stakeholder involvement piece in your slide. Um, focusing on more of the beginning stages of a project. You kind of touched on this in your last answer when you talked about evaluation. So I'd be interested in hearing more about involving listening and community engagement and empowerment in kind of the later stages of sure. the project. Um, so uh, so from, uh, I'm going to take that from an evaluation stance first, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, why the design piece I think is pretty um, important. So. Uh, there are uh, different ways to listen uh, in an evaluation uh, perspective that we've been, from an evaluation perspective that we've been trying out. Uh, and so, for example, there's this organization called 60 Decibels. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They are a spinoff of the of, of Acumen Fund's Lean Data. Uh, and uh, what they've done is, if you're in the social enterprise in the impact investing space, what they've done is, is they, they've driven the cost of getting mobile data um, uh, uh, down to a very, very small amount. Um, and then also uh, tested out and created a set of questions that can be asked um, across different enterprises, communities, like um, clients, um, so that, uh, so that it, it actually helps to drive down the cost. And what they do is they go um, and they work with a social enterprise or companies, um, actual clients to be able to generate different types of insights uh, from their work, at, at including the um, net promoter score, which some people feel strongly about um, one way or another. And then they bring it back to the enterprise. And then the enterprise, the fund manager and ourselves have conversations about that data. And ideally, um, that's one form of listening. Um, and ideally, and, and we can kind of get a sense of, you know, how we're doing. Um, it's not a full on evaluation because the sample size could be very off. Uh, it could be, and it might not be statistically significant, but it gives us something to grapple on um, and to hold on to um, that enables us to have a better sense of what the actual end user is thinking and feeling about a particular products or an intervention. And I would say that the piece, um, we're getting better and better at that as in the philanthropic space and in government space. I, I hear like 60 decibels is, uh, is one company, um, but there's like others like Viamo. There's just different um, organizations really getting into this business. And I think the piece that we struggle with um, is that once you get that information, it's, it's an extractive process unless you actually go back to the communities and share out what it is that you've learned uh, and test out whether or not it's valid or not. And that's the piece that I think we're all getting, trying to get better at that gets then to that empowerment piece. You know, and it's interesting. I have a couple of thoughts about that because there's this presumption that what it is that we want to know as a philanthropy is the same thing that a community wants to know. And so when they, when we share back what we hear, um, we believe that they will care. But at the end of the day, they actually don't necessarily see our questions as the most relevant questions to ask. So that kind of brings me back to the design piece. Um, by the time you get to the end, there's very little control that you have about um, how the 
program has been designed. At the design stage, if we were to uh, optimize for um, stakeholder listening, I think that we would the, the, the actual program in itself would be different. And so there are some organizations and philanthropies that are actually um, co-designing, co-creating uh, their programs with communities, um, marginalized communities. Um, there are some philanthropies that are uh, particularly the community foundations that are actually working with the community for the community to be the people that are asking the questions and deciding what questions are being asked in order for it to, to know what the efficacy of a program really, really is. And that I think adds in an interesting layer um, of, of a community accountability that um, I think would increase the uh, viability of an actual program to be successful. And so I've been saying recently, um, we were part of a collaborative called the Fund for Shared Insight, which is trying aiming to scale out uh, user feedback. Um, and and one of the the sayings that they say is, you know, listening and feedback um, sounds like the right thing to do. But what we really need to demonstrate in this environment is that it's a smart thing to do. That it could help us drive um, uh, performance and achieve more equitable outcomes. And so that's something that I think we're working on um, that, um, that is a work in progress. Thank you, really interesting. Thanks. Questions? Thanks, Caroline. Do we have any other questions from the audience? It's a very rich uh, discussion and there are so many inspiring uh, uh, points and in, in directions uh, that we can follow. So it looks like- Please. I can, I can have a question. Uh, Thank you so much again for speaking. I really appreciate it. It's great to have you here. And I, I was, I and I, I appreciated the the poll question that you asked about uh, if you could address one thing in the world, what would it be? And uh, uh, my answer actually was social unrest and human rights because I actually feel like it is the most upstream out of all of these. Uh, because if you address that, then many. Of these other issues can be addressed. These uh, different answers, specifically from this group of public health professionals and students and such, I was wondering what this kind of question and discussion looks like more when you ask it to yourselves in your own foundation and what it looks like within philanthropy in general and other industries that you interact Great. with. Um, so we we're so every foundation uh, there's a saying that we have across the philanthropic space that if you know one foundation you know one foundation because of this lack of accountability um and uh which is a great thing on one on the one hand um and not so great on the other hand uh we all approach our programmatic design and our strategy design just completely different vastly different and some of it is based on the cultural values that we uphold uh, and so the Rockefeller Foundation is one of those organizations that's known for thinking for an awful lot of time. And uh, it, it's about internal reflection. So we spend a good amount of time before we launch um, what is pretty common in, in the philanthropic space, an RFP or another grant round or a challenge or any of those things, we actually think very, very intentionally. And so um, we, uh, we have a new president. He's actually not that new. He's been president for four years, but if you've been in the philanthropic space for like 12 years, um, it almost is like this moment in time. So in our last iteration, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how it's different now, um, uh, Dr. Judith Broden uh, actually add, um, created a methodology for answering your question, Alessandro. He, and she basically split all of our work as an institute up into three phases. Um, this space where we were, we were ourselves scanning and searching the world for the most uh, prominent issues. Uh, so we asked experts, we visited places, and that took a couple of years, but let's just say that we had like 100 questions and we used our scan and search function to actually narrow the, that 100 down to 40 questions that we would then um, basically get really smart on and do our own internal research, um, hire consultants, hire researchers to help tease out whether or not we used to say there was a there there. We then um, narrowed that set of 40 down to like six. And those six questions, areas, per particular, uh, specific areas we could intervene in because uh, the it was the right time because it met a couple of different um, levels of criteria around like whether the Rockefeller Foundation should be the entity 
versus some other organization. Um, so we narrowed that, uh, that, that set of six questions down by um, um, actually experimenting. So um, bringing on, hiring some um, people to help us experiment across those six. And ideally we would narrow that down to one question. So we would go from 100 to one, and that is the one area that we would then bring to our board of directors for approval to actually then do. And that process could take like five years. We were thinking for a long time. So our new president comes in, Dr. Rajiv Shah, who is um, trained as a doctor, has spent time in the energy space with the Gates Foundation, former administrator of uh, US Agency for International Development. And he said, five years is a long time. <laughs> We're gonna to have to figure out how to expedite this work. Um, and so uh, the nice thing about new presidents in, in philanthropy is you can completely pivot your internal processes too. So while many other organizations actually have learned a lot from our experimentation of that particular process for identifying issue areas, we no longer do that. Um, and what we do um, uh, is his strategy has been hire experts. So the best way to know about what are some of the issues that we can tease out internally is to hire experts. In our last iteration, we mostly had generalists. We had a lot of really smart people that could do many things, horizontals, but couldn't necessarily, needed a lot of support in order to get deep. In our current model, we have a lot of experts. Um, we have an expert on pandemics. We have an expert on health. We have an expert on energy and equity and things of that nature. And so together, um, we um, leverage our expertise to do a couple of things. One is get really deep on what is the next best thing that is on the horizon. Um, Dr. Raj Shah's um, perspective has been uh, very much about pushing the envelope around uh, the new frontiers. Um, so uh, we had a precision public health initiative, for example. Um, another one was to think about, you know, what are the next big issue areas? So access to energy is an issue area. We've been thinking about how that very much is um, a key. Uh, if you don't have energy, you, you can't connect to the economic market. And that's kind of the space that we live. Isn't there something that we can think about there that can both be clean and green, for example? Um, we have been thinking, uh, and then we're responsive to the time. So uh, we're in the middle of COVID. Like there was no place in our in our in, in our agenda that uh, didn't have us in the COVID space. So we've had to shift around and pivot a lot of teams. Um, very similarly, there's like there's no there's no way we wouldn't be in the equity conversations. And more than we have in many of the years, uh, our new president has brought the equity agenda to our, our institute in a way that has allowed us to respond to, to some of the challenges that we're seeing. So I call it the art and science of coming down to like the specific areas where we're working. Um, and sometimes there's a methodology and sometimes there's not a methodology. Uh, I, I'll just end that question by saying that um, with the new tech giants, like, like the Googles and the Amazons, um, it's been really interesting to watch them grow up mostly on the West Coast. Uh, and so there's like this East Coast, West Coast philanthropic thing. And um, you know they, you know they come to the conversation, and I think you know really, really smart people with really good intent uh, come to this conversation and think things like, "Oh, that's old school. We're new school," and you know they quickly learn that this space of social change is so complex, and that it really does help when you have people that have that that know that at your table to be able to design and deliver for. Um, for, for initiatives and strategies that, that actually will deliver the results that you want. Uh, and it's been really interesting to see them kind of grow up over the last couple of years and at least and acknowledge that it's not as easy as it seems. Just because you have a lot of money and you throw it at a problem doesn't mean that it's actually gonna fix itself. So there's been a lot of growth in some of that new financing um, that, 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 that has emerged. And I think that there will continue to be so. Great opportunity for public health uh, to be in the thrust of things. Um, any final questions from the audience before we wrap up uh, today's session? I hear someone strain. Maybe car. <laughs> <laughs>
No, no other questions. Last opportunity. Okay, if there are no other questions, um, I think we can wrap up. Veronica, thank you so much. Your wealth of, uh, you know, information, knowledge, insights. Um, this has just been uh, really inspiring and uh, we'll definitely follow up uh, with more, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, and, and, and explore, you know, how uh, the school can work, uh, you know, further with you um, in the foundation on various fronts. Uh, I want to thank uh, the audience for joining us today. Um, it's been a great session and thanks for all the, uh, the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, please, uh, you know, uh, stay in touch uh, with, uh, with, uh, with us, uh, with the school. Um, there are many more grant rounds coming up uh, this semester. Uh, and I'm sure everyone here is going to be on the mailing list. Um, so as we continue our virtual mode of work, uh, we look forward to uh, engaging with you um, uh, frequently um, online uh, throughout the semester. Uh, so thank you all very much uh, for uh, participating today. And thank you very much again. Thanks Veronica. a lot. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Have a good evening. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye.